The Tonnet Café chair, known as the number 14, was the chair which brought mass production to furniture. The Tonnet factories turned furniture making into a production line, a series of modular components screwed together in which skill was taken out of the hands of the workmen who became machine minders. It was a way to make things cheaply, economically and very successfully. In its first 40 years, the Tonnet No. 14 chair was made in its millions, the first time in history that had ever been done. The B3 Vasily chair, designed by Marcel Breuer. The Vasily chair was named for Breuer's friend, the painter Vasily Kandinsky. It first saw the light of day as an idea in Breuer's mind when he was cycling the streets of Dessau on his trusty Adler bicycle. He looked down at the handlebars and suddenly realised the potential of tubular steel as a material to make furniture. Alvar Aalto's 406 chair. There's a long tradition of small countries using design and architecture to project a sense of who they are and what they are to the outside world. Finland, which only emerged as an independent nation from the ruins of the Russian Empire in 1917, is a very good example. Alvar Aalto, a national hero whose face actually appeared on Finnish banknotes, set out to create an image for Finland which was about modernity, newness and self-confidence. Alto also produced a series of innovative furniture designs for Artec, a key Finnish company of the 1930s and 40s, still around today. Artec based much of its production on birch plywood, a national resource, a very Finnish material. Alto used this material to create a cantilevered chair, a sinuous, elegant form that's very comfortable too. Ira Saarinen's tulip chair, made by Knoll. Saarinen was a very successful architect. Uh, he produced, among many other buildings, the TWA terminal at Kennedy Airport, in which the roof is a series of soaring concrete shells. There is something of the geometry of Saarinen's organic approach to architecture in the tulip chair. But what makes it possible is the potential of glass reinforced plastic to adopt almost any shape, this organic, elegantly smooth form. Werner Panton's Panton chair. Panton was a Danish designer, initially trained as an architect, who set out to disrupt that idea that we have of Danish wholesomeness, that things are made of wood and are crafted. He wanted to use modern materials in a frankly psychedelic way. He was dreaming for many years of making the one-piece injection molded plastic chair, the holy grail of plastic design. It took him a long time to get there. The Panton chair first saw life as a sketch design back in the late 50s and it was only when he met Vitra, the Swiss-German company, that it began to go into production. A new generation of engineering expertise and new grades of plastics finally made Panton's chair a success when Vitra re-editioned it at the start of the 21st century. Joe Colombo's Universale stacking chair for Cartel was one of the defining chairs of the way that technology changed the way that chairs looked. If you go back to the early days of mass production, you'd have to say that Tonnet set the pace with Bentwood and then tubular steel. And then in the 60s, the Italian companies led by Cartel started to look at the possibilities of a new material, ABS plastic and moulding. And that could finally industrialise the process of making a chair. Colombo's work with Cartel set the pace for that. Colombo's biggest achievement with the ABS that he used for the Universale chair was he managed to make a material associated previously with the cheap and the mass produced into something that seemed special and precious. Gaetano Pesce's Donna chair, named for obvious reasons after the idea of womanhood, Look at the form, it's a mother and child, the stool is the child, the armchair is the female form looking like some Henry Moore sculpture. Pesce was that generation of Italian designers who were looking beyond the idea of function, using design to sell things. He was looking at ways to express emotional attitudes to the world through designed objects. Frank Geary's wiggle chair. 
Frank Geary belongs to that tradition of architects who have renamed themselves. He was born Frank Goldberg in the same way that Le Corbusier was born Pierre Genre and Ludwig Mies van der Rohe was born Ludwig Mies. He's also proof that architectural careers can begin pretty late. Post 50 is still young for architects. And when Geary designed the Wiggle Chair back in 1972, he was totally unknown for architecture. He'd done a few not very distinguished projects. The big stuff was yet to come. In those days, he was hanging out with the artists in California, and it was that tradition that the Wiggle Chair made from cardboard can be seen. A transgressive object, but one which somehow works. The Aeron Chair is one of the many great success stories of the Herman Miller Company. Herman Miller is one of those giant American furniture companies which cluster together in the town of Grand Rapids in Michigan. It began by making domestic furniture at the beginning of the 20th century. And then in the post-war years, it discovered Charles and Ray Eames, who created for them a whole series of remarkable pieces of furniture design, which still look as fresh today as they did when they were first produced. It's a company that's gone on innovating, most recently with the Aeron Chair. The Aeron Chair is based on an understanding of the way that our bodies move and operate at the workplace. We spend so many hours now tethered to a desk that unless the chair understands the movements of the body, it's going to create problems for our backs. The air chair, designed by Jasper Morrison. The technology on which the air chair is based comes from the car industry. It's a means of using gas moulding to create very cheap car parts for the interior of standardised cars. Morrison put it to work to create a chair, a very simple, refined, elegant chair, and a reminder when you look at the process of making the chair that sometimes the tool that makes the chair can be as beautiful as the end product. Konstantin Grzic's Chair One. Konstantin Grzic trained initially at John Makepeace's Parnham School for Craftsmanship in Wood. Not the most predictable beginning for a designer who's emerged as one of the most successful contemporary designers of his generation. Chair One was designed for an Italian company, Magis, which specialised actually in injection moulded plastics of various kinds. And Constantine challenged them with Chair One because it's mostly made with aluminium. He deliberately set out to come up with a new aesthetic, something that was slightly uncomfortable, unfamiliar, fresh and new. And it derives, as he put it, from the way that a football is put together with fragments.